Well, hello. Uh, well, I'm in Schiphol Airport. I've been working in Holland this week, just uh, on my way to the plane to fly home. And I've had quite a bit of time to think this week. And I've been thinking about fatherhood, uh, I suppose partly because of the last blog that I did, where on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was so clear that one of the credentials of his that Jesus most wanted Peter, James and John to see was the fact that he was the son of God the Father. That was really important to him. Then 22nd of November, so that was this week, uh, is the sixth anniversary of my dad passing away and I've been thinking about him and the degree to which he shaped how I see myself and how he gave me confidence because of his constant affirmation. And then that got me thinking about being a father to my own two daughters who live funnily enough here in Holland. And just thinking about what is a father, what is a father supposed to do? I think definitely affirmation, identity, security, protection, they're definitely part of it. But in this blog, which I'm going to continue when I get home, I want to start looking in the scriptures a little bit and see what can we find about what kind of a father God was and how does that map to what kind of a father I should be or you should be. And we're not saying that mothers aren't important, obviously of course they are, but I just want to focus on fathers in this particular vlog. Well, hello. Yesterday, there I was in Schiphol Airport waiting for a plane. It was dark. I was a bit fed up because the plane was late. But here I am one day later and yet again, I'm in the middle of beautiful Cheshire countryside. The sun is beaming down and you can probably see it on my face. But because it's really cold and it's been frosty overnight, in fact, if I just turn around, you might see the sunlight glistening on the heather where tiny little drops of water are just reflecting the sun. You can see it's actually a little bit misty as well. But for the 20, whatever it is, 25th, 26th of November, this is amazing. So we're being really fortunate this year with the kind of weather that we're getting. But you remember we were talking about fatherhood yesterday, weren't we, in the airport? And I, that's what I want to develop over the next couple of vlogs. Because having a father and who the father is that you have is incredibly influential. And being a father is a massive privilege and a solemn responsibility. But fatherhood is at the nature, or it's at the centre of God's nature. So when we were talking in the last vlog about the transfiguration story, of all the things that Jesus wanted to demonstrate to those three disciples, Peter, James and John, the one that he saved for last, and therefore the most important, was the fact that I'm the son of God the Father. And God the Father made it very public that Jesus was his son and that he was well pleased with him and that we should listen to him. So if it's so fundamentally important to God himself, it needs to be important to us. And I suppose it's just easy to take for granted that fatherhood is at the centre of the Christian faith, but that's quite a unique idea and it's also quite a controversial idea, surprisingly. But if we go back into the Old Testament, the Jewish people had no doubt whatsoever that God was their father. And God made it very clear in his writings and his speaking to the Jewish people that he recognised that he was their father. So how about this? If I look at uh, Jeremiah 31 verse 9, for instance, this is God speaking to the people of Israel. They're in captivity and he's promising them that he will bring them out of captivity. And in the course of saying that, he says in verse 9, With weeping they will come, and by supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of waters on a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. So God is designating himself as the father of the Jewish people there. And then in uh, Isaiah 64 verse 8, we read, But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. So they're owning God as their father and recognizing that he shaped them and made them who they are. 
So it must be important that God is our father. And if we're going to be good fathers and have good fathers, then we need to learn what is important about being a father. What does God think is important about fatherhood? And that should be our starting point for being fathers so that our kids get the fathers that they need and that we're grateful and acknowledge the fathers that we have had. Well, this vlog is definitely turning into an Anglo-Dutch production. So we started in Schiphol Airport on the way home last week. Then we did a bit while I was back in England at the weekend. And here we are back in Holland, finishing it off. But if we uh, think about God as our father, there probably isn't a better place to go to in scripture than Matthew chapter six, because that's where we find the Lord's prayer. And the very first line is our father. So we're onto a good thing there, I think. But the thing is with the Lord's Prayer is we're all really familiar with it, aren't we? We've all recited it many, many times. I started the school day at primary school and my first grammar school every single day by reciting the Lord's Prayer. And on the one hand, reciting it so often is good because it's got scripture going round in our mind. But the danger is that we say it so often, we actually forget what we're saying and we don't realise quite how radical some of the things in the Lord's Prayer actually are. So if you take verse 11, for instance, it says, give us this day our daily bread. We think, yeah, yeah, that's great. It seems a quite innocuous sentence, really. But if you think about the context, the backdrop against which Jesus started to tell people that that's how they should be praying, then it seems like quite a radical idea. Because if you think about it, that part of the world had been dominated for thousands of years by pagan gods who had to constantly be appeased who hated the people who served them and were very difficult to persuade. And we see people doing tremendous things, awful things, actually, to try and get those gods to show them some kind of a favour. So for Jesus to start walking the land and saying, actually, my heavenly father loves you so much that he's interested in your daily needs. He's willing and able to provide those daily needs. That was a really revolutionary idea. The thought that you had a God who was huge and yet was worried about the small details, that was something new. And it would have been quite shocking to the people who heard him say it, but there would have been a ring of credibility to it because they'd seen him feed multitudes on more than one occasion. And Jewish traditions and histories had the stories of how God provided manna for the people of Israel in the desert as they were on their way out of Egypt but it would have challenged their way of thinking about God for sure. And actually, I think it's supposed to challenge our way of thinking about God as a father too. So I love providing for my daughters. I consider it not just an obligation and a duty, but an honour. But there have been times where my best efforts just haven't been enough to provide what they need. And to be able to go to God, my father, and say, please help me be a father to them by sovereignly and supernaturally providing has been an incredible comfort. And I think that's why lines like this line are buried all the way throughout Scripture. They're designed to provoke. So when we read something like that, we need to stop and start to meditate, to circle around that verse and let it convince us. And as we become convinced, that's where what we call faith kicks in. And as we become more confident and convinced that God as a father really is a provider of our basic daily needs, then we're going to pluck up the courage to actually test him on it, to trust him on it, and to reach out to him and say, Lord, will you help? I need your help to provide my basic daily needs. I really do my, need my daily bread. 
So he is enhancing our ordinary daily lives as a father. But then over and above that is, if he calls us to do something which is not financially viable, but is necessary for the kingdom, we needn't worry. We can afford to be obedient to what he's calling us to do, knowing that he will take care of our daily bread. He will provide our basic daily needs and we don't need to burn energy fretting and worrying about where is the next paycheck going to come from? Where is the next food going to come from? Where are the clothes going to come from? And to me, this is not just theory. This is practice. I've had to live this out repeatedly in the last year or so. And I'm not going to claim it's been easy or a completely peaceful process. But there has to come a time when we actively step out in faith and say, Lord, if you are my father in the way that you say you are, then please will you help with my daily basic needs? And then the more times we see him provide those needs, the more confident and peaceful we are that he is in control and he will provide. I think he's putting those scriptures there to provoke our faith so that we see him correctly because it's important that we understand that a really fundamental part of God being our father is him being a provider just as he wants us as fathers to be providers. It starts with him and all we're doing is replicating in our own families what we see him doing in his family of which we are a part.